It's time to start again the Magic Learning Coffee Seminar. Welcome, and today we have Jukka Koranda, who is leading the FKI program on a simulator-based inference, and is going to talk about an exciting scientific advance today. Welcome, Jukka. Thanks, Sami. It's a pleasure to present some of the fruits of our most recent research. And uh, nice to see you here at this point of the early hour, late in the autumn. You might, oh, the forwarding doesn't seem to, oh, there we are. So you might ask, um, why should we focus on bacteria? Uh, if you have read the author Yuval Harari, he is mentioning that us humans are the dominating life form on this earth, on, or a species. But um, he might have forgotten that bacteria are also capable of genocide. If you wind back the clock quite a bit, so you remember that, or you might have read back in the school that bacteria were responsible for a mass extinction by releasing, for instance, oxygen into the atmosphere. So, and they are, they are part of every ecological process that happens on Earth. So it's, it's good to be a bit humble and and put focus also on these tiny creatures, which we mostly can't see by the <coughs> naked eye. Most biologists today would agree that everything we see around us, every living organism is shaped by natural selection. And that must be largely true. There is compelling evidence for that. But if we think in terms of very short timescales, or months and years, just a few years, you would also think that there's room for neutral variation to accumulate in populations for different organisms that we're interested in. And neutral variation in terms of genetic drift then was shown about 15 years ago to well explain the patterns of relatedness amongst bacteria. We could sample regularly from daycare center groups, from school classes, from nursing homes, and so on. Unfortunately, it turned out to be a bit of a red herring uh, because of the limited lens that we still had 15 years ago. We couldn't sequence whole genomes, so we wouldn't actually know how much variation there is in populations. And th those small numbers of marker genes that were used 15 years ago to study the evolution of these bacterial populations didn't provide enough evidence to actually see some of the more subtle patterns of selection. And here is a very strong empirical proof of selection acting over short time scales, over a couple of years only, to select the shape of a bacterial pathogen population, in this case, Streptococcus pneumoniae. Um, I'll present briefly, I've shown these in the previous presentations before, but this will be a background for the new work that we have done most recently. Let's just focus here on the rightmost column of this figure where we have uh, results from a study that was published in the Nature, Ecology and Evolution a couple of years ago, where we looked at these populations, geographically determined populations of Streptococcus pneumoniae, which is a major human pathogen, killing about two million people annually per year. So, and it historically has been a major cause of human mortality and morbidity be because of the uh, the diseases it causes, pneumonia, sepsis, and a couple of others. So what we have here is on every row we have a geographically determined population. On the topmost row we have Massachusetts in the United States, then we have Southampton in the middle from UK, and Nechmergen from the Netherlands at the bottom. The x-axis in this column shows frequency of a particular accessory gene, actually all genes that we have been able to find in samples, longitudinally sampled cohorts from these three populations. And these are then uh, annotated genes which we have roughly 5,000 of across these three populations. And the genes are not part of the so-called core chromosome, but they are pre present in, in members of the species at variable <coughs> frequencies. And the x-axis depicts here the frequency of each such gene on, at the particular, uh, uh, which has a functional annotation mentioned here. So this shows overall what the frequency was before a vaccine 
campaign was launched in each of these three populations. So most countries in the Western world routinely vaccinate small children against Streptococcus pneumoniae, targeting a part of the population. So today the most advanced form of vaccine is a so-called 13-valent PCV vaccine, which targets 13 different serotypes of this bacterium. I'll come back to the serotypes later. But then, so when we look at the pre-vaccine frequency of these genes, uh, and then we compare that with post-vaccine frequency, you see extremely strong correlations in all of these three geographically determined populations. And that is very compelling evidence that the selection of who got to reproduce after the vaccine killed roughly half of the population in terms of the numbers of strains that were circulating in a particular geographical area. So 50% of the strains were slaughtered. Nevertheless, when we look at data here four years after the introduction of the vaccine and then plus four years from that, we have very strong positive correlations in terms of frequencies. So that these three genes have returned into the frequencies they were at before the vaccine was launched. And that's highly unlikely to happen under neutral variation. So if these frequencies could change at will, then we would have expected much more loose association here. And where does it come from? So we have a mechanistic explanation for why this has happened. And it's based now, we then encapsulate this understanding in a fairly simple statistical model called the Wright-Fisher model in which we put a non-neutral mechanism of selection. And uh, just a recap of the Wright-Fisher model is in this case in its simple form, we have a finite population, let's say 100,000 hosts in a particular population, and then we have discrete non-overlapping generations, so we have here time t plus and, and t plus 1, and now we ask the question here that who is going to reproduce, uh, it's basically bootstrapping the population into the next generation. If it was completely neutral evolving population, in a neutral model, everybody has the same probability of getting to reproduce for the next generation. So here, in this scenario, that genotype, so I forgot to say that these hosts are now colonized by a genome-wide determined genotypes. So that, that genotype reproduces to get two copies in the next generation. And in the non-neutral case, we need then a mechanism which is actually time-dependent in our situation. And it's largely reflecting a phenomenon which has been well studied in ecology known as frequency-dependent selection, where, for instance, rarity gives you an advantage and selection will hit you harder when you become more common. Here are a couple of examples from observed populations concerning mimicry and how that evolves, co-evolves co with, uh, with the other species the mimics are trying to copy and then experimentally with social behavior of birds. So here is a simple form of our uh, model which encodes this mechanistic selection for the next generation. And in simple form, we have three parameters here. We're asking now the question of who is going to have how many offspring at the particular point in time indexed by t. I is an index for a genotype, and this is now a determined by its genome content, which I will come back to on the next slide. And we assume that it's Poisson distributed with a certain rate parameter, lambda it here. So it depends both on the genotype and the population status at this time t. And the lambda it is composed here on three, three different main parameters plus then carrying capacity term here, which is basically just we have to cap that how many hosts can be colonized in the population. So for our target application, we assume that carrying capacity is 100,000 hosts. And now we're then asking questions that how do these parameters influence your possibilities of reproducing for the next generation? We have a vaccine effect parameter VI here, which means that if your genotype contains elements which the vaccine is targeting, then you will be, your ability to produce offspring will be reduced depending on how large the vaccine effect here is. If it was zero, then you notice that the effect will vanish. If it's one, uh, then you would have no chances of reproducing if you have 
uh, if you are targeted by the vaccine. Then we have a migration parameter which is telling that we allow the system not to be closed, so my genotypes can migrate into the population from outside. If migration was zero, it would be a closed system. And if it was one, then the whole population would be replaced by migrants in a single generation, and that's highly unlikely to happen in a real situation. And then we have the negative frequency dependent selection parameter here, which, if it's larger than zero, will encode this selective mechanism that we are trying to now use to explain why those gene frequency correlations were actually present in the empirical data. The exponent here then is something that we determine on the next slide. And the selection mechanism that we have at play here is such that there is no universal winner. We can't say that that genotype is always more fit than everybody else, but it depends on the situation. So it's a kind of a rock, paper, scissors game where somebody will always win you at the given point in time. So nobody is universally uh, the fittest. And how we encode fitness here in terms of our model is that we have equilibrium frequencies of these genes. So they are indexed by L here. Small case L is now indexed for a locus or a gene. And capital L is the total number of these genes that we're looking at, in our case, let's say 5,000. And then we have an indicator function here telling that if your genotype I contains this gene L, then we measure how far away the current population, this is the current population frequency of that gene at time t. So it means simply that if the current population frequency is below the equilibrium, then you will get a fitness boost when you want to reproduce for the next generation. If it's above the equilibrium frequency, then you get a negative sign. So because we sum then these contributions together to get the exponent for the for the equation. So we are thinking that if a genotype contains many genes which currently are under the equilibrium frequencies, selection will favor you to produce more offspring because that will mean that those gene frequencies go, will go up in the population. And this is a schematic explaining this picture or the, the model behavior. So the different colors here represent different genes. And we think here we have the equilibrium frequencies of genes, and we have genotype, uh, we have their frequencies in the population at the time, and they will get boosts depending on how far away from the equilibrium you are currently. So this means that under no intervention, then the population will hover around this equilibrium, and then when the intervention, like a vaccine campaign, is launched, then the selection will act to bring these genes back to their original frequencies. That's the idea encapsulated in our model. It's a bit complicated, so uh, uh, I'm not expecting you to fully grasp the mechanics, but I hope to give you enough intuition to follow what's coming next. And then we have a five-parameter version of the model where we actually encode the idea that not every gene is under the same selection pressure. So we split them into groups of strong selection pressure and weak selection pressure, and then we estimate two selection parameters plus the, this fraction parameter, and we call that heterogeneous multilocus NFDS model. And lo and behold, when we fit the model using ELFI uh, software algorithms, the Bayesian optimization for likelihood free inference, I was struck a couple of years ago when I was doing this inference by seeing that the strength of the selection seemed to be nearly identical, give or take 1% one, 1 in all these three populations. And that is suggesting that the similar mechanism is at play in each of them. So now I can show you a glimpse of the empirical data from Massachusetts and Southampton. This hopefully then uh, illustrates a bit better why the neutral model is so unlikely to produce the patterns that we actually do see in the data. So this is again a bit complicated plots, but let me walk you through that. So the numbers at the top, they refer to genetic backgrounds of these bacteria. So these come in families or clusters, if you like, just like if we would have people from, let's say, Eastern Finland, we would have people from Japan, we would have people from Brazil. They are genetically, in the human population, they are 
clearly distinguishable differences between these populations, so they, certain SNPs are more common in, in a particular population than in another. Although in, in humans, the effects are much more subtle than here. So you can think that every number refers to a genetic family. And then we have a time structured frequency uh, bar plot here, where to the leftmost we have the frequency of a particular family before the vaccine campaign was launched. In each of these cases, we have 12 years worth of monthly data. So we have those frequencies there before the vaccine, four years. Then we have four years from the rollout of the vaccine, and then we have plus four years after that. So you can think that the, the mid part represents where the disruption was the strongest, and then this is where we should be again at some kind of an equilibrium, at least close to that. And these are the empirical data. These are 100 uh, forward projections from our model with the 50 model parameters. And the red here indicates a vaccine type, so it means that in these different genetic backgrounds, we can see both non-vaccine and vaccine types. And if you're, you remember that if you are a vaccine type, then the vaccine was targeting to eradicate you from the population. So we see a pattern here that these red bars are declining all over. So they are going downwards, as expected. But then what is peculiar here, there are a couple of examples where you see that the bar at leftmost side of this genetic background means that this family had hardly any members present when the vaccine, was, uh, vaccine campaign, campaign was started. So they were at very low frequency here, these genetic families. Nevertheless, you see that like this family here bounces up enormously just from the start of the vaccination campaign. And why is that? Because this represents what we would expect to happen under a neutral uh, population evolution. Namely, this family had high frequency at the start of the vaccine campaign, and it remained to have high frequency. So hardly anything happened here. So by the neutral model, we would expect that the, your chances of reproduction, so to, when the vaccine leaves this void, would be proportional to how common you were before the vaccine was launched. So the more common you were, the higher the chances of, of you reproducing. And we see truly that for that genetic family, that holds true and also here. But then we see these exceptions where, where things that were very rare, uh, there's a consistent pattern that things that were rare were picked up and pushed to much higher levels. So it's, that's highly unlikely to happen for so many genetic families that we see empirically. And that, that's according to our model dictated by this negative frequency dependent selection that these genes are uh, benefiting extra from being rare and therefore they, the genotypes that carry these genes, they are pushed upwards. <coughs> and we see largely the same kind of pattern happening in Southampton as well and in Nijmegen. And now we have data from uh, five different populations in Africa which is still unpublished and we see exactly the same kind of pattern there. We have separate work ongoing also from other parts of the world. So every population gives another example of this same kind of pattern happening. So we are pretty confident on that this negative frequency dependent selection mechanism is definitely there. Of course, nature doesn't roll a dice that, that gives you Poisson uh, distributed random numbers, but nevertheless, our model predictions are sufficiently accurate so that we believe you can use them for useful stuff. And this useful stuff, which is new in this presentation, starts here. So I mentioned serotypes as a uh, as an concept for this uh, pneumococci, which are used in the vaccine as a target. So serotypes are basically, if you're not familiar with uh, molecular biology, so serotyping is almost 100 years old technique by which you can you can, with a certain reaction, measure uh, different kinds of, of pathogens how, and typically connect it with their propensity to cause disease. It's often done with a, with a reaction, for instance, with a rabbit blood, and it has to do with the binding of, of the antigenic sites. And the, for pneumococcus, we are currently aware of roughly 100 different serotypes. 
And for the currently licensed vaccine, the PCV13, 13, 13 of these are then packed into this polysaccharide vaccine, which triggers your immune system to recognize these and then prevent colonization and onward transmission, and therefore reduction in the, in the amount of disease. So these are just a couple of examples. They are named by combinations of numbers and letters. So let's say that we would make a vaccine. And so we could choose to put certain serotypes in there. And they are no denoted here by SI and SJ. So I have a list of 100 serotypes from which I can pick. They have different propensities to cause disease because they pack different genes. And that probability of causing disease for a given serotype largely is an unknown thing. So we have to estimate that from the data. So we have to rely on epidemiological studies where people have compared that how often do you get disease versus non-disease here, so the complementary event given a particular serotype, uh, SJ, SI, and then we have the same for SJ. And then we ask ourselves a question that does SI have a larger propensity to cause disease than SJ? So some of these serotypes are much more virulent, so are much more potent in causing invasive disease than others. Some of them uh, have hardly ever been seen to cause disease, others very frequently so. And of course, if we think in terms of vaccine, we hope that it would be maximally effective in reduction of the disease worldwide. And when the original PCV7 was launched in the United States in 2000, it quickly reduced the disease amongst infants uh, and it was considered to be a success story. But then when the vaccine was rolled out elsewhere in the, in the world, the reductions in the numbers of disease cases was much more moderate. In some of the developing countries, only 20% of reduction in disease was observed, despite that this is an extremely expensive vaccine. And that is then a dilemma because it's a great uh, burden for the public health officials to roll out these vaccines. And if the reduction is di in disease is only uh, moderate, then you're not actually getting as much public health uh, outcome as you would have hoped for. So now there is a problem that how can I design effectively a vaccine by using at the same time data of these propensities to cause disease? Uh, like here, where I have uncertainties about it. So these studies can be done in different, different parts of the world because different serotypes tend to be at different frequencies. And then on the other hand, I have to factor in the prediction. I have now a prospective model which says that if I launch vaccine of a certain kind, it will do something for the population. So the distribution of genotypes will change. And that influences which serotypes will be around in the future. So I can combine these, these things to predict post-vaccine disease levels. Because we have a model, and if we have metadata about the, these uh, disease-causing propensities, now I can start to ask a question that, what kind of a vaccine composition would be optimal for reducing as much disease as possible, as cheaply as possible? Then Caroline Collin, when she heard of our NFDS model, she had this ingenious idea that man can make this much faster because the combinatorial explosion is quite steep here. So if I have a vaccine with 10 different slots, then I have something in the order of 10 to the power 13 different possible vaccines. Uh, if I had 20 slot vaccine, which is currently considered to be the most uh, high, high coverage vaccine that you could practically make, uh, so it would have 20 serotypes. That means we have something in the order of 10 to 20, perhaps, different vaccines. So clearly we can't go through them all. Even with Google's quantum supremacy, it would not be feasible. So this forward simulation with our C++ program takes something depending on the parameter values. It would take uh, in the order of half a minute to a minute and a half to run one uh, one complete series of population evolution. What Caroline came up with that we can make a first order approximation by replacing this discrete non-overlapping generations right Fisher model with an ODE system. And the equation for that system is given up here. 
So now we have a system that evolves in continuous time. And what the system models is basically the genotype frequencies as continuous variables. So I is still the index of a genotype. F, F is the frequency of that genotype in continuous time. And this is the derivative describing that how does the frequency change as a function of time when I have a number of components here. So this is just an ordinary error term. So we have for each of those genotypes I, let's say that we have 1,000 such genotypes in the population that we try to model. So then for each of them we have an ODE. And this is a term related to the carrying capacity. This is a vaccine effect term. And then we have the rho, which governs the negative frequency dependent selection. So this is the same kind of expression that I showed you earlier, but now with GIL rather than the indicator variable. So we have a weight for every gene that is determined by the estimated parameter of selection strength <coughs> hitting these genes. And then it measures the, the difference between the equilibrium frequency of that and the current population frequency. The nice thing, especially nice thing with Caroline's idea is that this system of ODEs, even though we have hundreds of them or even up to a thousand, uh, can be solved effectively using existing ODE solvers. So in a matter of seconds rather than running a one minute long forward simulation. And then we have, then the problem from the machine learning or AI perspective becomes that how can I combine this effectively to search for good vaccines, which have good predictive properties of reducing disease. So we have derived different means of giving a score for any outcome. So it's basically the predicted disease levels. And also we have factored in antibiotic resistance so that you can minimize the resistance that comes from the use of the vaccine. Because in some cases, accidentally, the vaccine could boost these highly resistant lineages. And this is showing from the prediction that this is data, this is simulated. So if we compare our NFDS model, uh, if it was perfect, then everything was falling on this line. But we see that when we compare with, with neutral model, we are much closer to this, this line here in the middle. So meaning that we can more effectively reproduce what happened truly in the population over the course of time. And here's a couple of example vaccines that we are have derived, some of these have been now patented. So here's for Massachusetts and for Myla refugee camp. The take home messages here is that there is no one ring to rule them all uh, solution here that the vaccine should be optimized for the local population. What we used here was a uh, fairly straight out of the box Bayesian optimization, but this is a hard problem. Remember that we have, have this discrete space, so we can put in these serotypes into these slots and then ask what's the predicted reduction of the disease in the next 10 years in the population, for instance. Now the problem is then, of course, that for binary spaces like that or binary variables, it's much harder to do Bayesian optimization than, than for continuous variables. And therefore, for the next uh, follow-up work, we are already working on, on extensions where we utilize the latest techniques from machine learning community which try to solve such combinatorial problems by relaxation and a number of other techniques. So this is just to show how we, much we predict that the, the disease levels would go down. And it's quite remarkable reduction. Uh, this is for the standard infant vaccine only. So the current practice is that public health officials target infants because they are the main carriage population for this bacteria. But it also affects a lot of the elderly. It's a major cause of disease for old people uh, by causing pneumonia. So we show that the overall invasive disease score could be significantly reduced if we actually introduced a complementary adult vaccine. That's what the cover here stands with just 10 serotypes. And these are different vaccine formulations. These are the predictions. And for instance, here in the Mala population, this is the prediction of what would happen if we launch the PCV13, the currently licensed best vaccine available. It would not give us a near, even nearby as good reduction in the amount of disease than is predicted by some of the other vaccine formulations. 
the, it has never been used in this. No pneumococcal vaccine has ever been used in this refugee camp. And we see that the, the outcome wouldn't be uh, perhaps motivated by the high cost of using such a vaccine. And this is the Massachusetts population where we see that the current vaccine, because it was developed in particular with the US data in mind, it, ha it is already quite close to optimality. But much more work is uh, still needed. Uh, in the early phases of this work, we used this ELFI software. I'm just mentioning it because it's one of the highlights efforts of FCI, in particular the simulator-based um, so, uh, inference program. And this is a large-scale software pro project that uh, Sami and I are currently leading together. And I think it ho holds a great promise for the future. And there are lots of machine interesting AI and machine learning problems embedded here. And uh, in the interest of, of time, I think I stop here and take questions if you have some. <coughs> Uh, because of the sheer size of the, if you think of this space here, so we have this combinatorial explosion. There are so many different vaccines we could consider. So it's really impractical. So we want this tool to be practical for those who develop vaccines. So if, if it took a couple of uh, years to run an analysis, that's completely impractical for laboratory use because the vaccine development efforts are they are long-standing uh, billion-dollar projects and where there are different uh, sections of the project so w w and they rely always on what was done before so it would be really impractical for a major pharmaceutical company to to wait for months and months so that you can get some initial idea that how should the vaccine look like because there will be engineering difficulties as well so we, we would like to naturally solve this problem in a reasonable amount of time and the ODE solution gives us a, uh, at least an order of magnitude faster solution, which is then, uh, so it's much more feasible to actually search in the space of vaccines because of we, have to, we have to consider these predictions of what will happen in the future if I did use this vaccine or not. So that's, uh, that's basically the, sort of the key argument. And because of the fact that we are currently working on order of magnitude larger data sets than, uh, than in this work, which is currently uh, under uh, review in a journal. So we uh, had more like a proof of concept there, but with concrete outcomes. But now we are uh, already working on the case where we have 10 times more data. And there it becomes even more burning question that you can actually handle that, because even the ODE solving becomes very challenging when you have thousands and thousands of these genotypes in the model. So then AI, there are different AI techniques that we are trying to combine there to accelerate it at different stages of the, of the model fitting. So when you move from the uh, discrete type system to a continuous type system, do you still need to use like your free internet? Could you just use the standard like your base technique? Uh, no, so that's a, that's a very good point. So what we're actually doing here is that the, we need to retranslate the parameters. So these R and rho, they have to be refitted. What we do is that we, we consider the time evolution of this model and fit its prediction to what the uh, forward simulation gave from the, uh, from the discrete time model. And so we are doing the inference only indirectly here because we are assuming that these uh, these parameters are universal, so they're actually the same for everything. So we just need to do this inference once to be able to use it in the predictive or the prospective modeling framework. Could you do the whole modeling with the continuous time system? No, I think we could, uh, definitely, because we are, we are here refitting the parameters, so we could use the same kind of uh, mechanism, but this is 
of course, this is an approximation. It's a first order approximation to the to the model that we have there. So something that we lose here is obviously that with because we are not explicitly format simulating the whole distribution, so we are losing uh, something of oh, great software management update popping up. So what we are losing here is the ability to provide us as need uh, confidence intervals for some of the outcomes that we have here in the explicit forward simulation model. But for the vaccine search, that if you ignore the uncertainty about the parameters, then, then the ODE approach is much more powerful than this one because it saves so much time, given that we are able to solve it efficiently, which at the moment is doable, but for the next generation data will be much more challenging. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so the, the, the vaccine itself that goes into the OB, right? Yes. I, I yes. Out, but yeah. then they are discrete parameters. So could you then say that instead of being discrete, you say that they are real values between 0 and 1, mm -hmm. and then try to optimize the vaccines using the kind of Boston derivatives of the OB? Oh, you mean that the, the basically that these would be like uh, fuzzy memberships? Yeah. Oh, yeah, so yeah. Versions, yeah. again. Yes, that's something that we're exploring at the moment. Yeah. So how the vaccine goes in here is that the, if you put in a vaccine, it will try to kill by this effect here. It will try to eradicate from the population certain genotypes. And th that means that it will try to slaughter, reduce the frequencies of genes. And because we assume that the population is, will try to return to the equilibrium, that will then implicitly give a boost to other genotypes because they carry certain genes here. And if the genes are under the equilibrium, they will get higher chance of reproducing themselves. <coughs> so the, that explains basically the mechanism why we saw those rare genotypes jumping up all of a sudden after the vaccine introduction. It's because they were given they were given the opportunity of, of more efficiently spreading these genes around because those genes want to be at a certain frequency according to the underlying biological mechanism, which is made out of three, uh, three processes, some of the things which have to do with antigenic recognition and so on. Uh, I don't have the time to go into the details, but we can make an offline discussion about that. So that's how the vaccine then, then uh, changes the population. So it, wipes out some things and at the, at the same time gives other things possibility of spreading themselves. And we want to predict how that impacts the disease in 10 years time because those things that spread may actually be highly virulent. So we have ex lots of examples in the world where, uh, for instance, in France now, in just two years, uh, one particular serotype, when it arrived to France, it uh, has caused so much meningitis in small children that the uh, meningitis rate, uh, child per 100,000, has gone up to the same levels it was before the vaccine, the 13 valent vaccine was launched there about 10 years ago or more. So the, these uh, changes can be really rapid when something that's potent and virulent comes, let's say, from abroad and starts to spread there uh, because it ha it, there is a niche for that genotype to be spread around, which is left by the vaccine. So the, the consequences in terms of disease rates can be quite dramatic. And that's something that people uh, didn't understand before. Uh, it's only in the last few years there's, been a, there's now been this opening into the unwanted consequences of these uh, vaccines, which are in a sense, imperfect, because you can never target. Uh, optimally, you would try to wipe out all these things which cause disease, but that's just not practically doable. But you don't want to uh, wipe out things which hardly ever cause disease and then give extra space for those which are highly virulent but currently rare. Yes. So do you know how, how accurate, is, is it the bottleneck that the OD is, is a first order approximation, as you said? Not, not at the moment as far as we see it. It's doing its job fairly efficiently. So that's not the bottleneck. It's more about the scalability at the moment. But of course, if we, we are also trying to work at the more high fidelity version of this, which 
would even enable us to pinpoint more clearly which exact genes are under under the selection pressure because currently we have we are just grouped them largely so it's basically that we have the selection parameter at the group level but we are trying to make that even more sophisticated so then when we encode that into the ODE it may become a bit more difficult time will tell so the here machine learning is definitely needed in the future in more advanced uh, form to try to do the search also in a smart way to exploit continuity rather than make it the discrete combinatorial optimization problem. So the, the ODE seems to have an error term. Yes. So does it make it an SD then? Or Sorry? So is it then an SD because there's an error term? No, no, it's just uh, so what we have here it's just to denote that this is a first order approximation so we just neglect that. So SDEs m would be powerful but they would be also be computationally much more hard to to deal with. So we, we basically have a system of coupled ODEs here determined by this relationship and then we solve that numerically which can be up to let's say 700 equations that can be done in three seconds but then it becomes impractical when we have 3,000 or 10,000 of these that we are working on. Uh, you said that the R and the row in this equation yeah. are like estimated by some discrete time system or that. Yeah, that's the data basically. The predictions that we, uh, the selection strength parameters that we got from the discrete model. So we just fit the outcome from here. We choose these parameters in a way that it, it uh, sort of copies the behavior of the discrete time model. And why is that model then discrete? Uh, it's just for the sake of this formulation here that when we were wanting to uh, encapsulate this in a way that we have a time dependent selection mechanism, the non neutral right fission model seemed to be the most straightforward way ahead here sure. to actually encapsulate. Uh, like a straightforward way to transform this into a continuous model also and but are there any obstacles? Uh, so the, the inference and if we have to it's more about the that how do we then select these parameters from the data so now we are now we are basically uh, fitting the continuous time version model onto the outcomes from the discrete model just for the sake of simplicity but the details are in the paper, which hopefully will be accepted tomorrow. So, but there is a bioarchive version, so if you are interested in looking at it, so it's, you can find it with the author names. Um, from, it was submitted to bioarchive in, in May. So uh, Colin Coranda Croucher in alphabetical order. <laughs> All right, any more questions? We are also running out of time. Oh, yes. Thanks a lot. Thanks.